Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the BallQuest.com podcast with Jesse Simonton, Rob Lewis, and Austin Price. Brent Hubs, glad to have you along with us. It's Florida week, Tennessee coming off a shutout over uh, Chattanooga. We'll talk much more about the Gators uh, throughout this podcast and obviously our Friday podcast as well. But let's rewind a little bit on, on Chattanooga. Uh, from an individual standpoint, I thought Jesse hit it in his, in his review piece, kind of a bigger picture look as opposed to just Tennessee winning that game. Uh, what, what's, your, what's your offensive takeaway? We'll start on the offensive line. Is, has Tennessee found their five? I asked this question last week about what are we looking for, Jesse? You said you know, they had to find their right guard in this Chattanooga game. Did they find their five Saturday? It seems like they're much closer to it. I think the question now actually reverts back to left tackle. And if Jameer's healthy, does he kind of, you know, take does he take that spot back from Wanye and Wanye kind of becomes the super sub to maybe uh, let Trey, you know, get a breather for a couple snaps or uh, f- flex back out to tackle and, and play some while Jameer sits. But it seems like, based on Jeremy's comments Monday, uh, while I think they'd like Darnell Wright and Cameron to be a little more productive, I kind of outlined it in my piece. There's going to be some growing pains, I think, especially with Cameron as a pass protector. But you look at what he was able to do specifically as just kind of a road grader in the run game at right tackle. How could you not stick with that group? Yeah, and I, I talked with somebody who knows a lot more football than I do, and they said the main problem with with K. Ron right now, and it's understandable, is that like his past sets, he's setting up like a guard still, which is where he's worked primarily for his two plus years on campus. And somebody who knows a lot about offensive line coaching said that's that's, that's a pretty easy fix. You know that if a guy can hold up in the run game, <laughs> that's a that's a real secondary concern. But that that is somewhere where he's behind as a pass blocker, playing out the space. It's a lot different. Secondary concern overall, but a major concern this week because you're playing a, a team that can a, get off the edge. Right, a team that leads the nation in sacks, in part because they got ten off the edge basically a, against Miami. So we'll dive into this again more on, later in the week, and, and Rob will have it in the matchup piece and everything else. How, how do you help? How do you help? Calvert, how do you help Wanya Morris? You can't help both of them probably at the same time on the same play. So how do you help them? Is this rollout stuff? Is it three-step stuff? How do you help out do, young offensive linemen? Well, go ahead, AP, but I'll go ahead. I was going to say, just get the ball out of JG's hands quick. You know, and I mean, you've got those big wide receivers. You let them use their bodies. And, you know, if, you, if, if all of a sudden, you know, the quick throw game or passing game, whatever you want to call it, um, is, is basically an extension of your running game, then, you know, I, I think that, that that's the way you go. But, you know, I, I don't let, you know, JG – some of those play-action throws seems like it takes forever to get set up against these defensive linemen. And, I, you know, I mean, they're, they're a little dinged up up front, Florida is. But, I mean, like against this group, you can't – to me, I don't think you can ri- risk those long play-action passes. Do you? No, but I do think they're going to max protect. I, I, my guess is we're going to see a Austin lot of – se- I think we're going to see a lot of seven-man protections, you know. Um, kind of what they did last week where they, you know, put Carvin and, and Locklear out there as basically a pseudo-tight end. Yeah, and they and they ran out of, out of that set mostly, but they did – I mean, uh, but to AP's point about, you know, some of those long drops, I mean, I think Pruitt said it in his coaches' show, Hubs, that that touchdown pass that I had, you know, in in the in the review that Calvert got beat on that play-action pass that went to Tillman. But part of that was J.G.'s, you know, deal too. I mean, he was late, and it was clear, you know, some people on Twitter were like, no, he would And, I mean, Pruitt confirmed it, that he took, you know, five steps or whatever when it should have been three, or you know, and so uh, – he, he does have to get the ball out of his hands quickly. I, I expect Tennessee to attack Marco Wilson. I know we're gonna, you know, we'll del- dive deeper into into that as the week goes on. But the Kentucky had a lot of success going after him with Henderson, who's one of the best cornerbacks in the SEC. Out, we don't know his status as of you know Tuesday. And you got the safety out for the first half. Yeah, right. and I, I was yeah. going to say this goes. The, I, I agree that the short passing game is going to be the way they go. But it goes back to Hubbard's favorite point every year when it's Florida week, if you're going to have success in the short passing game, you're going to have to beat press coverage off the line because it, it just, you know, disrupts timing. You you take three steps back and, all, you know, the guy guy's not where you thought he was going to be because he got hung up at the line of scrimmage. And that, that's a battle Tennessee has consistently lost. Yeah, I was to say with the exception of one game, Tennessee's lost that battle for 10, 12 years. Which seemingly. is why you got to run the ball. And Pruitt said that. Got to run it. Got to be effective on first down. Um, you know, and, and that type of thing. Can they run it, though, is the question. Can you run it based on what you saw on, on the last two weeks? Tennessee got wide against BYU. I, I didn't think I, – I mean, they had early success running the football. 
Then they went through this period of, of time where they didn't run the football particularly well with their starters to close out the first half. Then in the second half, you got a lot of backups going on. It's hard to judge a lot of different things that way. But after that fast start where they averaged about eight yards a carry, they didn't average but about three yards a carry for the, for the rest of the first half. They're going to have to be consistent in their ability to run the football. They're not going to average eight yards a carry or whatever, but, but they're going to have to be able to line up and run the football consistently for four quarters. Yeah, and Eric Gray, I thought, missed a, a hole or two at times. But, and that's, but I think that's why they're going to go with you know, the upside of Calvert. At, at right tackle and, and Darnell needs to be better a, as a run blocker but again his potentials there it, it has been interesting that thus far he seems uh, to according to PFF and even folks that you talk to they've kind of been surprised even his ex, you know his his head coach was like man he's you know ran into him the other day you know he's, he's been better than I think folks expected as a pass blocker and now they kind of need to, to get that dog out of him you know that, that he kind of showcased to become a five-star just kind of mauling people as a run blocker. I would just wonder how much his head was spinning on him on Saturday. I mean, you know, look. For sure. They were playing a team that, that they were they were vastly superior to. They did what they needed to do. Get him in there and get all the work he can. But, I mean, you're, you're cramming a lot on his plate in about a four-day stretch, five-day stretch well, to ever, try to get ready to play. Well, like one year they played him at guard in the fall camp. They never did that with Darnell. Yeah, he was at right and, tackle and, the whole and, time, and, right? Right tackle the whole time. And, then, you know, and Outside of about two days, three days at the Under Armour game, where I mean it's all kind of just fun in the sun. Well, it's all one on one. He's never played inside, and you so um, I, the the word I kept getting from multiple people was the what you just said. He, he's just swimming right now. I mean, like he, he, it's 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 coming. It's slow, but what the flashes that he shows is better than what they've had out there with. You know Ryan Johnson and or Riley. So you know, and I, I agree. I think just you know they're going to make mistakes. You know they might give up you know a few sacks Saturday, but the potential to make you know a key block that springs Eric Gray for a forty yard run is much more prevalent with that group than it is with you know the guys that have been here for four years. Yeah, and I think it more than and you're right on a forty yard run, but for them I think they're looking for more of a four yard run. Can can you run it consistently four yards? three and a half, four yards of carry to where you're ahead of the sticks. Because if you're in third and long, it's going to be a long, long afternoon in the hot sun down there because they can, they can tee off and go at you that way. So that, that's where Tennessee kind of finds themselves on the offensive line. I, I do think the left tackle situation is, is kind of fascinating to watch because Jameer may, you know, probably will be healthy enough to go. He doesn't have a ton of experience at left tackle either. Right. And, and so it's not like you're getting back a veteran who's done a lot of pass setting out there against speed rushers and that type of thing because he doesn't have a ton of experience playing the left tackle position at this level. So this is what we talked about back in the summer. Are they really going to go into their first SEC game and play essentially two inexperienced tackles? They are, plus an inexperienced guard and trying to find their best five. And their left guard, by the way, doesn't practice three days a week. That's, that's, that's lost in all of this. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it's a pretty it's a pretty fascinating setup that they have on their offensive line right which, now. Which is why they're relying so much on on Austin Pope and, and DWA at tight end. And and I thought, you know, upon rewatch, again, it's Chattanooga. It, you, you can't make sweeping conclusions, but that was about as impressive as he's been as a run blocker since he's been at Tennessee. Talking about DWA Wood or Pope? Anderson. Yeah. Wood Anderson. Well, Pope's been good all year. And right. Pruitt commented that. Um, the concern there is how much do you rely on Austin a little bit too much? I mean, I had it two weeks ago that you know your hand. That, that that you know he was in on all those twelve personnel sets and Tennessee ran the ball somewhat like ninety percent of the time and eighty some percent of the time it was going to his side. Then you know uh, another you know media outlet does the behind the scenes with Chattanooga and they confirm that hey. We're, we're slanting eight to eighty-one side because that's where Tennessee's running. Um, so you know if they're picking that up, you know SEC programs with a million analysts, you know that are watching way more film than my, myself and the Chattanooga people are doing. I mean, so that that's going to be interesting, and that's again why I think Calvert could be an elixir to that problem because twice Tennessee did go away from its tendency on Saturday and they ran behind 74. Well, and look, you're paying an <coughs> offensive coordinator $1.5 million buck, you know, to, to buck the tendencies. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I get it. You've shown, you've shown your hand the last two weeks. You, you, you better have your counter to that hand right. because that's why he's getting paid the big money. And well, I like Jim, but 
you better have some some wrinkles coming off of that look. Well, and it's kind of like the you know the notion for the first two and a half games. Every time Ramel Keaton and Cedric Tillman come in, it's going to be a run. And then of course they throw the touchdown pass to Tillman late right. just to show a, a different wrinkle. You know. So yeah. I mean, like I, I'm not saying that the first three games and their one and two start they've been setting things up for Florida, but I'm sure that they can look at the tendencies too and go, okay. We need to be able to have a different variation. Well, one would hope so, because they've got as many yeah. analysts up here as <laughs> everybody <laughs> else has analysts. Sure. And they absolutely, I mean, flipping to the other side, Tennessee was absolutely very vanilla defensively Saturday, where they just decided, because the game got out of reach so quickly with the touchdown, blocked punt, you're up 14 you know, and it, Touchdown, that's 21 nothing. Yeah, eight and minutes so to go. they did not dial up very much pressure at all. Now, I thought, I thought and I put this – Crouch's usage was very interesting to me, and I think that's something that we probably will see moving forward with him. I mean, he's what, – what, AP? He's like 200 – like, he's not like 235 pounds. Kavar's Crouch is closer to 250 than he is to 235. Um, and so they played him a lot like a traditional – Defensive end. Buck defensive end with his hand in the ground um, opposite of Daryl Taylor, and he was effective. I mean, he was – Tennessee's defense that we can go in, I mean, I don't know where you want to go next, but Tennessee's defensive line continues to be really? uninspiring. So uh, I, I, I would play, I would play, you know, Kravar Scrouch a lot more as, as that standard end opposite of DT. I'm not trying to drive the hot train too high. I'm just saying I, I didn't I didn't really see Crouch being an edge player when he first moved over there, but now he's starting to look a little, not this good. I'm just saying physically he's starting to remind me a little he's like a little embryonic Mac Wilson or, or Tim Williams. You kind of see him you know turn it into that kind of guy. Yeah, I, I, I think finding his best spot, he's got to play the run better. He does. You, you know, he, he loses the football, which is to, to be expected because the only thing he's ever done on defense is in open space chase the football. Now you're moving him closer to the ball where he's got to see stuff fast. Or he's got assignment. You know, and, and he's got to he's got to read zone read better. And, and those sometimes he things. goes too high out of his rush lanes. Right. He did that twice too. But but from a talent standpoint, when you look at where they are and what they're trying to get to. You do see it. You see right. the same thing with Roman Harrison. You know, there's there's a play or two where they chase the ball down the line and make a tackle on the backside. That you're sitting there going, I'm not sure who else on the roster makes that play. In terms of the the, the upperclassmen playing in front of them, it's just that's this is a tall order for them going into this weekend, which for we sure. all know. But when you look at it big picture, those two guys have to keep coming for this team. Well, as someone told me, you know, a month ago. The guys that Jeremy was talking about, you know, when he talked about guys that may not be ready right out of the gate and may be ready game three, game four, were the Crouch, Roman Harrison, and then double down with, and likely by midseason, a guy like Tyus Fields. I thought it was interesting that Jeremy did bring him up post game. You know, I mean, like as a guy who who kind of flashed for him, and and you know, probably I think he's flashed for the coaches plenty in practice from that safety spot with just his aggression. So, you know, the more Tennessee kind of looks for a playmaker at safety, the more they, you know, go with Roman and he has success, Crouch success, Henry success, it makes it a little easier. Problem is, is you're right, when you're facing this gauntlet of SEC teams, <laughs> woof. <laughs> well, and Fields, I mean, Fields, I, that play was obvious. I was on the field for that play, and you could just see. I mean, he read and react and just knifed in there. I had it in the review. He's that, That's the type of – put that – you. That's why you play special teams. Put that kid on special teams. And you go and you go back to his reason. and you go back to his his high school film. I remember watching it for the first time, and I, the one thing, if having met him, in person, be surprised. I was shocked how aggressive he is. How much he loves contact. Like he was just so was like laid back, yeah. you know, super polite, and then you know put driving the, his jeep, just yeah, chilling. Yeah, with the top down. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think I think I think two things out of that. One, I think I think. Pruitt was trying trying to continue to give words of encouragement to his freshmen. Right. You're coming. We see it. We're going to praise it. Keep coming. I think the other thing, too, is message delivered to Trayvon Flowers, who's not existing, going the wrong direction right now. I'm not trying right. to pick on somebody. No, no, he, but he, but, but he his struggled. effectiveness is nowhere right now. I mean, this is a guy that everybody had a lot of high hopes for. He's been lost more than he's known where to go in the first three games. He's just not played very well. Nigel made a pick on Saturday, but also disappears from time to time, as we know. Theo's kind of been the the guy who's the most sort consistent, of but you kind of know what you right. get out of him. The upside right. isn't there. I mean, the one the one freshman safety that Pruitt did not 
shout out, but I thought upon rewatch had a nice game was McCullough. I mean, part of the reason Fields didn't fast enough to be a safety. That's the question. And speed is always – AP and I talked a lot about that when we were down at the Under Armour game. He's in the box. I think he's, like, perfect, especially down in the red zone because he reads and reacts so well, and he's a really smart player, which, again, upon rewatch showed, he lined up Tyus Fields almost every play out there. Like, Tyus did not know where to go, and McCullough was smart. He was, when, he, when he was close to the line of scrimmage, he could make plays. But the further, you know, the further ways he goes, McC- I think there, there's some concern there. McCullough, a more athletic Todd Kelly. Is that, is that kind of a, a, a good Potentially. comparison? Yeah. yeah. Maybe. You maybe, know? yeah. I mean, I mean you know, very smart, smart football player. Partic- particularly, particularly Todd after the, the – you know, you go back to Todd in the game that Tennessee beat Florida up here. Big interception. In the two. In, yeah, yeah, two interceptions. Yeah. He, was, he was fantastic in the run. It's the best game he played in his Tennessee career because I think it was as healthy as he's been. They just – it never continued because of the knee problem that he had. But that's not a bad comparison because I think, I think Jay McCullough has a, does have a high football IQ, which is important. I, I thought it was interesting. Um, take another shot, people. I just used the word interesting again uh, in your drinking game. But um, noteworthy, I guess, Jeremy Pruitt telling you in his postgame press conference, we, we haven't had a lot of alignment issues. The story in The Athletic that you were talking about earlier that David Ubbin wrote Chattanooga noted that they had more alignment issues in week two than they had in week one based on their watching of the film. Daniel Petuli's important for this defense. That was plain as the, the most obvious thing, Rob, for me to see on Saturday. When he's smacking defensive linemen in the leg, telling them to get <laughs> lined over, up, he's turning to the safeties, giving them the check. It was obvious how important he is to this team mentally yeah. as well as physical play. I don't think there's any question. and I don't – I mean, I'm – this is not a negative against Will Ignott. I'm just, if you think that he has the same grasp of the defense and the ability to help his teammates get where they need to be pre-snap as Daniel Batilli does, then I mean, you're... It was Ignott that was beating the hell out of his teammates, by the way, on, oh. the, on the video. Oh, was it really? Yeah. Wasn't Batilli? Yeah. I thought that was Batilli. It was, it was Ignott. But, but Ignott immediately got benched for punching a guy. So. Well, he should have. <laughs> but, but I saw Batilli no, but clearly Tule. communicate. Oh, no, there's, 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 there's a up. meme. It's, it's turned into a meme out there. Yeah, I mean, no. he, was, he was clearly lining, helping people get lined no up and, and communicating with the and I don't specifically with the, with, the, with the young safeties. And yeah, I, and I also don't think there's any question he's a huge benefit for Henry T. I mean, not that I mean, and that's very important. I mean, I, I think he takes a little pressure off of Henry sure. and just lets him go play. Yeah. Exactly. Don't I mean, you? I mean, look, you know, just watch and, for this. And I watch get for what, that. I get what Pruitt was trying to say post press conference or in his press conference. They haven't had a lot. Probably haven't had a lot of troubles getting the signals from the sideline. Okay, and understanding what the play call is. But we all know in this, in, in Jeremy's simplistic defense that's very complex, you have to make a bunch of adjustments, you know, based off site formations and everything else. And, and Henry's been asked to do that for a lot of people. Having Batuli back there to do that for these guys is a huge help to this, to this team. I, think, I thought of, of all the things they've done, that was as smart of a move as they've made this year getting him a few snaps on Saturday. He's clearly not 100%. He'll be better this week. But get lathered up, get get some game speed reps, even though it's against Chattanooga, then get him out of the game. I thought that was really good management by this staff and the medical people for, for Daniel Petuli this past week. Yeah, and then just keep getting more treatment until Saturday. Yeah. I mean, you've got to have him. He's got to play – a bunch, but he needs to understand game speed, needed a little bit of that. You didn't want his first game of speed work to be at Florida. So I, I thought that was a, a big get for Tennessee this past weekend. Jeremy did not tip his hand on Bryce Thompson. I think he did tip his hand to not to not just say no. I think he's, I, mean, I think I, you'll see him on the sidelines in Gainesville. Yeah, I mean, Will he it, play? Oh, I think if he's traveling, he's playing. I mean, here's, the, here's the question, and here's what I don't know. This is, this is on the grassy knoll deal. Is that Jeremy's call, or does he have to get approval? Does he have to get some other people to sign off on letting Bryce Thompson back on the field? Before he goes to court? Yep. I mean, maybe, but I mean, I guess my kind of logic is if you're deemed not a risk and you're allowed to go to class for weeks now, if you're allowed to go back to practice. Well, then my thing is why not play him some last week against Chattanooga for the same reason you played Batuli? Because he hasn't played either. No, I don't buy the whole he's out of shape for three weeks deal. That kid go out here and run. He can run for days. He can run 110s for days in the stadium. He's in a good enough shape. 
So why not get him a few snaps under his belt to get his confidence back going last week against my, Chattanooga? My, my conspiracy theory on that would just be for, for PR purposes, you can say you, you suspend him for three games. It's the only, only thing I would say. Cause I, I mean, like, again, I said – Three weeks ago, the most logical thing is is he comes back post bye week for the Georgia game, and he basically has missed the first month of the season. But but that means you're waiting until after the court date. Yeah, and and that, correct. But what Tennessee's needing the secondary, I, I, if I'm Jeremy, I play him. But that's just me. But again, the question I ask is, is that his call? And I don't know the answer. And nobody to that. does. No, I mean like you know, I mean I'd say very few people know whether that's his call or not. I mean I do find it interesting that all they announced was he could return to practice. I mean, it was kind of an interesting release, you know. We're letting him come back to the practice field, and all he said was, "Is he needs to be around his teammates." Oh, and then and then Pruitt on Monday when he was asked if he was traveling, he said, "I haven't decided that yet." That's all he said. So we'll we'll I mean, see. But what, what has been decided is that Alante Taylor's on notice. I was just, I mean, that Pruitt's statement on Thompson, I mean, gives the impression that it's his call, but right. But who knows? Yeah, who who knows on that deal? Uh, you're exactly right. What 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 is what is very clear from a statement standpoint in an unwritten word is that Alante Taylor is in the doghouse. Yes. And, this, and, this. and not just because of the one play at the end no, of the BYU game. And, this, and I remember, you know, AP and I both took some flack during fall camp when separate people had told us, hey, number four, Warren Burrell, is, is working his way into the starting lineup or over Thompson. number two. Yeah. And it was going to be Burrell and, 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 and Bryce. And, and a lot of those, you know, Tennessee fans kind of threw up their, their hands like, what's going on? And it's, you know, I think this has been kind of a, a, a multi-week deal now for Alante. And you saw it come to fruition on Saturday where he worked, I mean, he was playing mop-up duty with a lot of the backups and third stringers where, where Kenneth George played about all 40 snaps with the first, you know, the ones and some with the twos. All right, and you said it earlier, you know, you don't, you don't, Put a ton of stock and, and go over the top with some things in this game. But what do you make? It, what did you make of Kenneth George's play? I thought he was solid. I mean, just what you know, I, I, he, he he was around the football. Other guys, you know, Chattanooga dropped a lot of a lot of balls Saturday, but only by my count, they only dropped one on, on targets that were thrown his way. Um, I know this Tennessee's former defensive backs coach was always very high on Kenneth George. He played the slant really well. Yeah, he played the slant really well, dislodging the football there. You know, and and he's um, a get off the bus dude. For Tennessee, I mean, one of those guys. He's tall. That, I mean, he, he's put together. He, yeah, he, I mean, he's 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 a stout, you know, stout corner. So he just hadn't played a lot of football. So Saturday was big for him to play 40 snaps, you know, kind of in a row. I mean, that was big for Kenneth George's uh, the next step in, in, in his development. Now, as Jeremy said, you know, if he can continue on the practice field, I think you're going to see him. Obviously, with the caveat, we don't know right now on Tuesday morning what's going to happen with Bryce Thompson, but. I think, you know, my, my guess would be is that 41 and not 2 is going to start again on Saturday. Well, unless unless Thompson's available, then you right. probably go Burrell and Thompson and, and Ken George would be your third corner. Right. Would, be, would kind of be the, the way that that would go there. But regardless of that, it appears Ken George is ahead of Elante Taylor right now in terms of the depth chart and what that looks like. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the run defense up, up front. Since they gave up too many yards to Chattanooga, they're giving up too many yards. We knew that the run defense was going to have its set of issues. Are they what you thought they would be in terms of run defense? Are they worse than you thought you, they would be in, in, in run defense? Is the Chattanooga stuff just ignore some of that because that was mop-up duty with a bunch of guys rolling in so you don't get caught up in their 151 yards? Three games in, as, you, as they get ready to go to Florida, what do you make of Tennessee's ability to stop the run? I, I, that's about exactly what I thought it would be. I a agree. Average to below average. I, I would not get caught up in the 151 yards by Chattanooga because you're right. Some of it was against you know the reserves and mop-up duty, but they're not very good. But the more, I mean, you I know, would, I mean, I would forget about the second half. But the Georgia State game, 215 State, yards. That's I don't, you can't ignore then, that, even if it was the first Georgia game. State, and then even BYU. You know, Jesse kept talking about you know why is BUI you continue to try to throw it because every time they actually. You know, played behind their pads, got north south, they moved the football, go back to overtime. I mean, like when they wanted to just plow it right through Tennessee, they did. So, I mean, like, I just, Florida's not very good at running the football. The, the, outside of, you know, the end of the UT Martin game where they got a bunch of yards and mop up duty against UT Martin, and then, of course, the end of round against Kentucky the other day. Um, yeah, Kentucky you know, held them under 100 yards until that end of round. Or, play. or Hammond broke free. Right. They, they've not been a very good running team. But as Jeremy noted on Monday, 
they are going to be persistently trying to do it. So they're going to continue to run it and continue to run it and see if they can kind of break through, pop a big one. Um, so, I mean, I think Tennessee, to me, I, 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 you hate to play the, you know, this is the double edged sword. You, you'd like to sit back and, you know, see if your front seven can do it on their own, but I think you've got to bring kind of pressure from everywhere. You know, to, to try to stop the run. Well, you saw Tennessee run blitz on on first down against Chattanooga, and to open the game. To me, that's a sign of hey, we know we've got to be aggressive with stuff. Don't you think that they have to play that way in the run game? That that they've got to run blitz and give some exotic type looks and try to confuse a, a Gator offensive line that's not been real good. It's not been real good, and has a bunch of new starters out there. Um, yeah, you know, I just just pulled up the stats. I mean, Florida's averaging. 4.51 yards per carry this season, a number that is a bit inflated with some of those reverses and whatnot. Uh, and Tennessee's averaging 4.49, you know, through through three games. So they're they're kind of neck and neck right there uh, in terms of productivity. P. Ryan's a good running back. I mean, he is. I mean, he was solid for them a year ago. But as Tennessee fans can attest, I mean, if you can't block them, it's hard. I mean, John Kelly was a pretty good running back, and he struggled, you know, here several years ago. So. I, I think that Tennessee uh, absolutely. We, we t- they dialed back the pressure after the, the score sure. kind of uh, escaped escaped uh, so so quickly. So I would expect a lot of you know bare fronts and, and running some of those you know a gap blitzes like like uh, Toa Toa did you know on the first play of the game. Yeah, I think you have to. I think you have to be super aggressive because you can't let Florida get ahead in the sticks and and being third and short with Trask. We'll talk much more about specific matchups and things like that. Uh, in our Friday podcast uh, as we get you ready for Tennessee and Florida. Of course, we'll have things in the matchup piece. Uh, more Florida talk all week long as Tennessee uh, continues their preparations for the Florida Gators. Not a whole lot going on in football recruiting right now. Uh, Tennessee's on the road. I guess the staff, with that a noon game, I don't know if they'll be out much Friday night, Austin. I mean, it's Monday, or excuse me, Tuesday. So some of those decisions still being made, but hard to hard to see Tennessee – I, out, I would say, I would, say night. I would say Tennessee will have two or three assistants out Friday night. I mean, like, and it's not going to be like some wholesale staff thing, but I would say two to three make their way out Friday night. Um, of course, you know, kind of the big news on the weekend, you know, J- with two guys that took official visits elsewhere. Jay Hardy was at Georgia Tech. I don't perceive to be Tech to be any kind of threat there. Um, and Tyler Barron was at Kentucky. Um, from all accounts, you know, TB had a good time, but you know. When they asked him to stick around a little longer, you know, he, he got on out of Dodge. So um, I, I ultimately think it's Ohio State's the main competition with Tennessee there. Um, again, Kentucky didn't offer until a month and a half ago. And uh, and really, you know, I, I think the interest, the interest in Kentucky at all is based off the fact that, you know, Tyler's got a girlfriend that's going to be going to, like, I think, Morehead State. So, I mean, you know. I, I go with the Kentucky. It's not a factor at this point. What, wh- who's the factor for Hardy besides Tennessee? Who, who, who's in there? Georgia Tech, okay, I get that. He took that visit there. I don't see Tech being a factor. He's talked about taking other visits. Who else is Who else is he going to well, visit I mean, at this it, point? Well, I mean, like a lot of kids, you know, mentally you, you're always going to put like Georgia, Ohio State, these prime programs in your top. But, I mean, are, are, is he a priority for them? Right. That's my biggest question. And so right now I'm not sure he's a uh, priority for either one. Maybe he's a priority for both. I'm just saying right. I'm not sure so that's set in stone. Would you agree, Jesse? I, I, I would say he's probably not a priority for those guys. Yeah. I, I'd say he's much – I'd say he's a very, he's obviously a huge priority for Tennessee and then schools like Georgia Tech. Uh, and, I mean, a, a school like Oklahoma would love to maybe host him. He's not going that far. No. You know, I mean, like, it, you know. Okay. Tyler took that trip and and was that, miserable. Yeah, that yeah. said you got to change planes three times. And yeah. I'm not doing but again, that again. But again, though, Tyler, and this is why I say don't get caught in everything you read or see. Tyler, you know, was working the the Lee Smith Harrison Smith football camp this summer. New TV cameras were going to be there, uh, and he shows up in Oklahoma gear. Well, I know for a fact, based off of my conversations with him, that the whole Oklahoma trip was a disaster from a travel standpoint, and and they're not even a factor. So I mean, like based off of that. You know, just because a kid wears a shirt or sure. retweets something, you know, doesn't. But what does it mean? It means something, right? Uh, obviously, with, with the, uh, the away game, you know, nothing going on much. But Tennessee's still gearing up for that Georgia weekend. Looks like they're going to host quite a few there, Jesse. Yeah, and what I was going to say is it, an upset in Gainesville, I think, would certainly boost 
the, the potential recruiting uh, visitor list for the Georgia for game. the Georgia game. Not saying that it would necessarily impact any sort of decisions for any of these guys we're talking about or any of these five, but I think it would probably help the visitor list versus if, if you take an L and have the bye week and then, you know, uh, we'll see what time that game is. Does anybody even care about football recruiting for the Georgia game? It's all about Rob and the basketball well, that's, recruiting. That's where I was going to Bring go me Jaden Springer. That's where I was going to go next, Rob. And it, that, that is the weekend for Tennessee basketball. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean they'll have P.J. Hall be in later later on. They'll have, you know, a couple of high-profile juniors in. Where are they at with him, for, by the way? For official visits. <clears throat> I think they're in the top three. I think Florida and Tennessee, you know, his sister plays volleyball at Florida. Mm. I think Virginia Tech is a dark horse since uh, Mike Young got that job. Um, you know, long-time coach at Wofford. PJ's dad played at Wofford when Young was, was a young assistant back then, so he's known the family the whole time. But Virginia Tech, I mean, I think winning is really important to PJ. And, you know, Tennessee and Florida are set up to be very competitive, you know, top 15, top 10 type teams for the next couple of years. And Virginia Tech is, is not in that place. And, you know, it, playing in the ACC, I, I have a hard time seeing that one. So they're, they're in the middle of it. But Jaden Springer. What do you make of the Memphis stuff with Springer? Uh, I, but Memphis homers. Just huh. trying to convince themselves they got a chance. I mean, you, you know a little bit about this recruitment. I mean, we've, we've felt good about Tennessee's chances for a long time. I, mean, I think Memphis, I, I talked with some national people who have spoken with people around the Memphis program who, I mean, they were surprised Springer even took the trip. They don't think they have a chance. I mean, I've been saying for a long time, I think Tennessee's in good shape. I mean, Tennessee called Cam Hayes, who just reclassified. Before he reclassified, he was the number 17 player in the 2021 class. They, he was supposed to come in for a visit this weekend. They called him the weekend before and told him not to come. I mean, come on. They told the number 17 player in his class, who has since reclassified, not to, not to come to Knoxville. We, we, I mean, tells you that, tells it you tells that, me a lot about where they are with Jaden's yeah, It tells you a lot about what they feel. So we'll, we'll keep close tabs on that. That's the biggest thing going on in, in basketball recruiting right now and plenty going on. On the football front is it's Tennessee and Florida, and we'll get you um, as much coverage of that and get you ready for that throughout the week uh, as we do each and every week. But that's going to do it for the Tuesday edition of the VolQuest.com podcast. For Austin Price, Jesse Simonton, and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day, everybody.